imagine in prepare, preparing uh, for an event like this to get to know your speakers. Um, I had never <coughs> met Kent Stroman before um, we started to work together in preparation of this event and um, I, I just can't say enough good things about him. He's so genuine, um, uh, just so authentic and it's just been wonderful. He had the opportunity um, to come in a little early and he attended two of my classes yesterday uh, so he was able to engage with students and uh, it was just a, a wonderful experience. Uh, regarded as America's asking coach, Kent is a published author, popular presenter, effective consultant, and insightful thought leader. His purpose in life is to equip, inspire, and encourage. For many years, Kent honed his skills in the trenches as a fundraiser while developing a successful relationship-based model for engaging donors. Kent equips fundraisers, fundraising leaders internationally through speaking engagements, retreats, webinars, workshops, and his signature Asking Academy training program offered through the Institute for Conversational Fundraising. Please help me welcome America's Asking Coach, Kent Stroman. And I immediately need help with technology because I pushed all the buttons on this thing and um, they, they don't work anymore. So if, if there's a volunteer that can help with that, I'll, I'll appreciate that. So um, how about that morning session? Great job, Helen. Love, love, love it. <laughs> and there are two just super champions in the room. Is Kelly in the room or did she escape? I'll tell you what, your conference... Yeah, Kelly, your conference planner, has done a fabulous job. And will you help me say a great big thank you to Jennifer, who's made all this come together. Good, good, good. So, um, are we working? Oh, if it's working, I'll take it. Yay. Nope, not yet. Anyhow, in the meantime. Um, <laughs> So uh, I just want to get an idea kind of, of who's in the room. So I want to ask you um, if you'll stand when I describe you. First of all, those who your primary uh, responsibility is fundraising, director of development, uh, major gifts, that kind of thing. Would you just stand, look around? Okay. Good, good, good. Thank you. Okay. Great group. Um, uh, next, let's have those who are in the CEO position regardless of the title. CEO, executive director, president, czar, okay. Okay, great. Um, now, um, anybody whose primary responsibility falls outside of those areas, if, if you would stand. Okay, these are people here under coercion. Okay, got that, thank you. And um, now I wanna ask, um, would the philanthropists in the room please stand, thank you. Philanthropists. Okay, you can see we got a few holdouts. Well, um, just to, <laughs> don't, don't sit down, don't sit down, you're not, your job's not over yet. So a uh, philanthropist in, in my book is someone who does what they don't have to do. In our field, here are two examples. Contribute money, okay, that's a voluntary act. Or um, give time that you don't get paid for, a volunteer. So uh, the finest people in the world I found are those who are philanthropists, who do what they don't have to do. So um, anybody else want to join the ranks? People who do what they don't have to do. Well, would you give yourselves a hand? Our world is blessed as a result. So um, as we get started, I want to ask you, at each of your places, there's an um, uh, there, index card. And those are going to serve a couple of different purposes. 
But um, first of all, what I want to ask you to do later, I'm going to have you put your, your name on that. But for right now, on one side in large print, which means few words, okay, large print, I'd like for you to write your answer to this question. What would you say for you today is your biggest obstacle to successful one-on-one -on -one gift solicitation, okay? Over the years, I've asked this uh, question to hundreds of leaders across the country, and I've gathered those responses into uh, some research, some of which we're gonna touch on here in a moment, but um, I don't know if you know this, but you're part of my ongoing research, so uh, thanks, for, thanks for volunteering. As you're thinking about your response, and think fast, as you're thinking about that, the two most memorable responses that I've had, one, Somebody wrote a four-letter word on their card in response to this, N-O-N-E, none. Said, I don't have any obstacles. I wanted to trade places with the guy, okay? <laughs> but the other one, and Tom, you'll appreciate this because this came from somebody who was in higher education. Uh, I was speaking at a conference in St. Louis several years ago. People were sharing across the room, and here's what he said. So again, the question, biggest obstacle to successful one-on-one -on -one gift solicitation. He said, it's our gift prevention office. Now, I'm not gonna ask you to answer publicly, but in your organization, do you have a gift prevention office? If so, your job is to close it, all right? So um, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. Um, one of the things that, that Kelly didn't mention is that I'm an old college professor, okay? And you knew the old part, but uh, I used to be a college professor, and I come from Oklahoma, where we come from, pair implies two. Okay, so here's gonna be the hard part. This next part is in silence. I know it's gonna be hard, because we're fundraisers. But I'm gonna do a countdown, three, two, one, and um, at, at, when I say go, I want you to quickly, but very silently, pair up with someone you don't know. Okay, just get face to face with that person. Take your answer with you, and three, two, one, go. Okay, everybody have a pair? Someone you don't know. You remember the quiet part? Not working so well. Here's what we're gonna do, okay? So if you can hear my voice, clap your hand one time. If you can hear my voice, Clap your hands two times. If you can hear my voice, clap your hands three times. Let's do, let's go four. One, two, ready? Clap your hands four times. One, two, three, four. That may be the only applause I get today, so thank you, I appreciate that. Now, here's what I wanna ask you to do. We're all paired up, okay? And um, in just a moment, I'm going to have person number one just sh share the answer to, your, to the question. You're gonna have 30 seconds to do that. So person number one will, will speak for 30 seconds. Person number two will listen for 30 seconds. Then I'm gonna say switch. You're gonna to have to listen very closely because the din is almost deafening in here, okay? But when we switch, you're gonna reverse roles, okay? And the listener will speak, the speaker will listen. Which one is person number one you're asking? Well, thank you for asking. Um, so the only way I know to do this fair is uh, person number one is that person whose shoe size is closest to mine. And I know you've been standing there wondering how big are those suckers? They're 14. So Bigfoot will speak first and Littlefoot will speak second. Okay, you ready? You have 30 seconds, go. Okay, switch, switch.
And stop. Please stop. Can I clap your hands? You can hear my voice. Clap your hands one time. If you can hear my voice, clap your hands two times. And would you clap your hands three times? Okay, thank you. And at least we know we can count. So real quick, um, I, I'm going to ask for just a handful of volunteers. If you would please very briefly share the obstacle that you heard from your partner. Um, anybody want to volunteer what you heard from your partner right here? Do I need a microphone? Yeah. Yes, you do. Thank you for asking. I'm scared of this. Boo. <laughs> So uh, the big concern that we kind of uncovered and that I heard about was relationships, and that's when you start a new role, what relationships does the organi organization already have, what data can you pull from, and how you actually can start building those relationships. Okay, so how to start building the relationship, good. Right back here. Segmenting the messages so that they're appropriate for the appropriate mm. audiences. Appropriate message for the given audience, very good. Somebody else. Time, so making, uh, getting time on the donor's calendar, making the best of the time that you have once you're in the visit, um, that always seems to be the biggest obstacle. Okay, time. Uh, one or two more. Let's go over to this side of the room. Oh boy. Could, could I have you step up to the, um, the microphone there? And while she's coming to the mic, one more. Somebody in this area that's feeling kind of guilty? Thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> sorry, standing is hard. Sitting is also hard. Are there other things we need to talk about? I like about? to recline. <laughs> um, uh, one thing, she's with the American Cancer so uh, Society, yes, and uh, major donors, a lack of major donors because they do Relay for Life, they don't do capital campaigns, mm. things like that, so there isn't a lot of infrastructure to move those annual Relay for Life donors up. Okay, okay, very good. One more. Well, both of us selected time. Okay. And you need to create time, I think. And recently I was asked to do a big project, and I said, no, I'm going to work on fundraising. So you make a choice. Okay. You have to create time. Okay, time. So here's the thing I want to share. And by the way, feel free to go back to your place. And um, if, oh, this, this is the silent part again. We don't do silent? <laughs> so here's what I want to share with you. And if you'll just notice on the screen, you are not alone. Anybody feel alone? Raj? It's just you and me, right? So whatever the obstacles are, um, the, the, uh, the bad news is you're not alone. Somebody else faces that same obstacle. But here's the good news. They're all overcomable. And we got a jump start a while ago on the time. Uh, the, the idea of, of managing time, or actually it's really managing ourselves. But let me just share with you some of the top obstacles. Um, when it comes to, again, what do we say, su uh, successful one-on-one -on -one gift solicitation. What our research has shown, and by the way, these aren't in order, but the, the ones that I'm going to share, we had 33 top categories. I'm going to put the top ones on the screen. First of all, absence of a plan. We didn't have a plan to be successful, and we were very successful in implementing our non-plan, okay? So we've got to have a plan. Here's number two, fear. Anybody else besides me relate to fear? Um, I mean, what are we afraid of? And there's a long, long list. But again, I want to tell you that we're not alone. I'm going to share some things today that I believe can help you overcome that fear. Why do I have that confidence? Because I am probably, or was probably, the most fearful among us. And um, I'm just curious. What, I know what I'm afraid of, but what are you afraid of when it comes to fear in that face-to-face -face fear of rejection. Anybody else? I guess there's just four of us, Tom. Um, <laughs> let me try it again. Anybody else uh, have any like fear of rejection? Okay. Um, we're big on that. Lack of experience. Somebody said, I'm not very good at it because I've never done it before. And I think, you know, all of us started there. And um, that may be the most easy to overcome. No relationship. Helen, you did such a great job of outlining earlier and the, these expectations that we want you to go out uh, to somebody that you have no relationship with and ask them a big question. So we haven't met before. Tell me your name. Kelly. Kelly. Hi, Kelly. I'm Kent. You want to get married? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's no relationship, okay? And I don't recommend it. 
What was that? I told her to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, she doesn't know me very well. So, okay, no relationship. Uh, time pressures, and several people mentioned that already. Time pressures, and it's not just our our schedule that has time. Somebody else mentioned it's the it's the donor. Um, the pressure of bringing that together. And here's another big one. You know, what amount should we be talking about? Anybody ever feel anx anxiety around that question? We could spend a whole session on that. Um, Jennifer told me that we had to wrap this session up by five o'clock this afternoon, so I'm gonna have to really go fast. Um, and sometimes, somebody mentioned this, we're really not sure who to ask. And again, there are lots and lots of obstacles Whatever yours is, the thing I want to encourage you to do to begin with is identify it. Can't solve problems that don't exist, right? So, um, um, but I want you to write your response down in your notes because back to the card, on the other side, um, I'd like for you just to write down your name and um, your, um, your email address. In a moment, we're gonna pick those up and at the end, end of this session, um, I'm gonna do a couple of giveaways. Um, also, if you'd like to be on my uh, newsletter mailing, just leave your um, email address there. If you don't want to, please in very large print, write this two letter word, no, N-O, okay? And if I see a big no, I will automatically not put you on my email list, okay? So, fair enough? And so, in a moment, Jennifer is going to come around with a beautiful smile and an ugly bag and collect your, uh, your cards. So we'll go on with that. <clears throat> now, in just a moment, I'm gonna show you a brief video clip. Uh, poor Jennifer has seen this a couple of times already. But here's the question. Um, this is one of those things, there, there is a test, and I'm gonna tell you in advance what the question on the test is. Here's the question. How is this ad like or unlike your gift solicitations, okay? So that's the question, uh, pay close attention. How is this like the way we ask for money? It's hilarious, right? That's the way we ask for money, right? Okay, okay here we I'm go. back. I went to the women's conference in Nairobi and that's Save the Children, obviously. It was taken off on that. And a woman had, for years, supported a child and saved the children. And she wanted to go and see the child. They didn't want her to come. Mm. She went anyway. She never found the child. So I think you need to do your investigation on where you're contributing money before you do that. Okay, so sometimes in our, our fundraising, sometimes there's a mismatch between the expectations created by the appeal and the reality that follows. Somebody else, uh, what, what's your experience? Ways that it's like or unlike? I think the ad was entirely focused on the recipient, you know, what the company wanted. That's why he kept uh, saying 39 cents, 39 cents, but didn't think about what the donors perhaps wanted to give or what the people needed. It sounded like an amount that they had come up with on okay. their own. Yeah, so thank you. So it's essentially, it's, it's me, me, me. And one of the things that I want to, um, that I want to challenge you. I don't know what your fundraising communication is like, but I want to give you a tool to take back to evaluate it. Who's it about? And is it focused on, here's a, another really bad four letter word. So what's about four letter words? Um, N-E-E-D, need. And oftentimes we pair that with the word we. It's we need, we need, we need, we need. And your donors feel we need to death, okay? So it's, here's the thing. Um, need, organizations have no needs. Your organization doesn't have any needs. The, the uh, university foundation has no needs. Or if they do, nobody cares about them. But who do we care about? What is the object of the charity, the object of the philanthropy? And so again, uh, oftentimes people say to me, can't, I can't ask for a gift because, and I hear this me, 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 me conversation. When you're asking for a gift, if it's about you, you should be very uncomfortable, very nervous with that. If it's not about you, talk about the person who will benefit from it. So we got somebody else. Yeah, well, I had an experience a few months ago where I was asking for a very specific amount. Um, 
because I figured they would ask how much I needed. And of course it was $2,500 and immediately they were like, oh yeah, I could totally do that. And I didn't walk away satisfied. I was like, he answered that so quickly. I totally could have gotten so much more than that, you know, Mm -hmm. but you never know where to start. Yeah. And then you can't go back and be like, well, what about $5,000? Yeah. <laughs> and so we're going to talk about the, the whole idea of, of amount. And the other thing that I think was so well illustrated, wasn't it nice of, of them to make that video for us? Um, but the thing that was so well illustrated is how we make up answers. We make up random answers, and then they become universal. And again, they illustrate our fallacy on here, but they say it has to be, it has to be, it has to be a check. It has to be 39 cents. And I love the guy in the background, but it don't though. And ask yourself in the things that you're communicating, what is the stuff that's made up, but it it don't have to be that, okay? Now what was it, Will Rogers, um, once he he made this comment, he was complaining about people from Hollywood. Do we have anybody from Hollywood here? (laughs) Um, Good. Anyway, I said the problem with so many people from Hollywood, he said they know so so many things that just ain't so. And a lot of times that's our problem. We're sure about all this stuff, but it just ain't so. So we've got another response. Yeah, um, it reminded me, I once attended a conference where we talked a lot about how as fundraisers, sometimes we come from a place of bagging instead of a place of we're adding value to the world and you can join us in that effort. And that video kind of reminded me. Yeah, the begging, the poor mouth, um, do not go there. If we don't have honorable and um, uh, sustainable solutions to bring to the marketplace, then we should beg and people should not give in response to the begging, okay? So we we don't want to get in the begging business, but we do want to get in the asking business and we're going to shift to that in a moment. We got one more response and that is? (coughs) That is, um, that the Save the Children always got me in the wrong place because it was always I want you to feel guilty if you don't do this. Mm -hmm. And we want our donors to feel good about giving something. Wow, I love what you said. And so many times, in in so many different ways, and this isn't just in our field, but in our culture, isn't it amazing how hard we work to make people feel bad about doing good and feel good about doing bad? That's not our job. (laughs) We want to give people an opportunity to feel good about doing good. And if they choose not to, to be respectful of their, of their choices. So with that, um, what I want to suggest is that if we're going to be at our greatest effectiveness in asking for money, we have to learn how to not ask for money, okay? Who knows, um, who, who can finish this sentence? It's an adage in, our, in fundraising. If you want advice, ask for money. And if you want money, ask for advice. Now, like anything else, that can be distorted and manipulated into a negative place, and that's certainly not what I'm recommending. But I do want to share some ways that we can become skillful at not asking for money so that when it's time for us to ask for money, it can be highly effective. And uh, many of the things we're talking about are, are included in, uh, in my first book, Asking About Asking, and I think uh, there's still some of those available. Um, there are 29 of them available. They ordered 30, so you have to rush if you're going to get those last 29. And it's not funny, Ellen. Stop laughing. Um, and I don't, are those priced at retail? They're below retail. Oh, they're below retail. Yeah, yeah so it's like $39.95 and they're selling for $39.90 or something like that. <laughs> if, if that's too expensive, I've been told by some very good friends of mine that you can find it at certain garage sales, um, 25 cents. Or if it's signed, it's only five cents. So you have options. Um, it, what I'd like to do is just share seven tips to conversational fundraising. And by the way, some of what we're going to do is going to jump around a little bit in your handouts. In the lower right-hand corner, you'll see a number of um, uh, which page in your handout. So I think on page two, I'm going to share some of these seven tips. So um, real quickly, I'm just going to go through these. And then we're going to come back and, and kind of unpack them as we go, all right? So uh, tip number one define success. We're going to come back and give a specific definition. I'm going to give a definition that's a bit out of the mainstream. Uh, Number two is to use advice visits. Advice visits. Number three, call teams. And uh, tip number four has to do with a written proposal. 
Somebody said, are you kidding me? A written proposal for every gift? Well, if it's 39 cents, no. Um, but if it's a gift that would be a gift of significance as defined by the donor, if we're asking for a donor to make a gift that would be significant to them, our recommendation is to use a, a written uh, proposal and, and we'll elaborate on that further. A three-year price tag. Again, I'll talk a little bit about that later. And then tip number six is to discipline the process. We're going to talk a lot about the science and the art of fundraising. The science part of it can be disciplined. And then we can also discipline ourselves to be artistic. That's almost an oxymoron, right? And then tip number seven is managing your meetings. So when it comes to this thing about, about time, there are some, uh, some very specific um, uh, guidelines that will be helpful with you on that. So tip number one is to define success. Now, you can see on the screen, here's our definition of success. We, uh, we believe that as fundraising professionals, as fundraisers, that, def that success is serving donors by helping them make well-informed decisions. Um, going back to the video for a minute, 39 cents was the right answer for whom? The asker, okay, and, and my idea is that, that one answer at best is right for one prospect. And so this idea of, of one size fits all, that's a very efficient idea. It just doesn't work with people because, um, you know, we're not all the same size. Um, and I won't even elaborate. You just have to use your imagination. Um, so. In most cases, and, and again, I love what Helen was talking about earlier this morning, we come up with fake definition of, su of success. So you remember Helen said success, first visit, walk away with a gift of $1,000 or more, right? And in that environment, it's very clear what's success and what's not success. It's just not sustainable. And rather than that, we have the belief that the only person who can answer the question about should I give or not, what amount should I give, when should I give, and for what purpose, we believe those answers belong to the one making the gift. And that it's out of place for anybody other than that to make up the answer and then hand it off. Because we end up then with, it has to be 39 cents, it has to be a check. How many 39 cent checks would you like to deposit anyhow? So uh, tip number one is deaf. So um, let me just give you some other aspects. Um, the, there are two perspectives as it relates to success. Um, and those are from the perspective of the nonprofit organization, your charity, and then the other is from the viewpoint of the donor. So um, from the or perspective of the organization, success, we've got to meet our goal. Now, Tom, were you say, did you say $350 million for one? So, I mean, that's, where I come from, that's a lot of hamburgers. What did he say? Um, $350 million, how much did it actually cost, the whole thing? Wow. Okay. Would you speak into the microphone because the people in the back can't So, hear. yeah, what he's saying is that for the hospital, the, price t the children's hospital price tag on it was $350 million. $50 million was, was philanthropic, and $300 million came from, from someplace else. Now, if that's the price of solving the problem of building a, a building, $350 million, that must be a big building, big, beautiful building, lots of nice names on it, okay, right? So, I mean, that's the right answer for the organization. And so if it, whatever it is, if it costs $350 million and we raise $345 million, that's not successful, okay? But to take that answer and, uh, and uh, apply that to an individual donor, wow, we need $350 million, can I have it? I can probably get a slap for something like that. And so that's not the right. So another, uh, from the viewpoint of the donor, again, like we said, making a well-informed decision. And so um, we just met. I wonder if we can improve the relationship from where it started. <laughs> <laughs> so would you mind being my um, mega billion dollar 
donor, okay. I mean, not, not donor, donor. But so, how many billions are you worth? Work, work with me a little bit here. Okay, three billion dollars, three billion dollars. So, can she afford, if she, was, if she was motivated, could she afford to fund the entire hospital? You could afford that. I mean, could you afford that? Yeah, okay. What do you think are the odds that uh, Kelly's gonna donate $350 million to a $350 million project? Now, before you answer, and we know she's the only one that has the answer, what's your guess? Mary? Not, so one out of 10, probably a zero. <laughs> She didn't really, yeah, she hadn't embraced it yet. Now, you know Kelly pretty well, don't you? <laughs> Not yet. Well, you're going to want to get to know her from what she's telling me. Okay. And so I, I'm just going to ask you, with, even with your massive wealth, would, would it be likely that you'd fund the whole thing? So the right answer for the institution isn't the right answer for the individual. So again, we want to define success appropriately for the conversation want to help make a well-informed conversation or, or decision. So real quickly, you know, we've made reference to conversational fundraising. I want to just briefly touch on what it is and what it is not. So conversational fundraising is not, or excuse me, is um, utilizing natural, ordinary encounters to explore mission-centered, sustainable, relationship-based decisions. There's a lot of words in there. There are three core things I want us to focus on. First of all, um, the, uh, um, it's, it's mission-centered. The gift is about the mission of the organization. It's not about me as the asker. Do, uh, as professional fundraisers, do we play a role in that? Absolutely. Um, but it's not about me. It's about the mission. Secondly, sustainable. Somebody once said that you can raise money with a crisis one time. Okay, you can raise money with a crisis one time. You can't raise money with a crisis a second time. And, and so we want to ask in a way that's sustainable. And somebody said that if you ask an apple tree for apples, it will give you crop after crop after crop if you don't cut the tree down, okay, if you don't take the whole thing. And so ask yourself in our fundraising approach, are we asking, are we coaxing apples from the tree or are we there to take the tree? That's the sustainable part. And then uh, relationship based. And I'm gonna give you a contrast here um, because there, our, our fundraising tends to be either based on a transaction or a relationship. On the video, transactional. 39 cent has to be a check, okay? But here's our experience. If you seek a, a transaction, you may get a transaction, but it won't be much, it won't be often, and it won't be appreciated. On the other hand, we can pursue a relationship. I would love to get better acquainted with you. Part of what I wanna know is what are your goals and do your goals intersect at all with our vision, our purpose, our plans. We can pursue a relationship, and when we pursue a relationship, you know what we get? A relationship. Oftentimes, the relationship brings with it a transaction, and another transaction, and those transactions are more significant in terms of the number of zeros, and they're more repeated, and what I think is most important, they're more appreciated. It's more appreciated by the donor and by the donee. I mean, how grateful can you be for 39 cents? Even if it's 39 cents a day for the rest of a lifetime, that's not gonna add up to a lot. And so I'm interested in that, in that relationship. So um, conversational fundraising. What it is also is it's about conversation. And I'm not an English teacher, you figured that out already, all right? But the root word is converse. Now, I know that everybody in the room is well qualified to be a fundraiser because when you got the conversation started a while ago, I thought I was never gonna get it stopped. 
okay? So we know how to converse. Engage in conversation. Give yourself and give the, the prospects permission to talk about what we care about and uh, discover really what they want to accomplish with their own charitable purposes. So what is conversational fundraising? It's not. It's not confrontation, okay? And the root word is to confront. Who has, I'm not gonna say who has practiced confrontational fundraising, but who has been a victim of confrontational fundraising? Oh yeah, there's a few of us anymore. Why are they all just at this table? Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, sometimes it's very, very pleasant. I will tell you a lot of times, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be at church, and there will be about a seven, eight-year-old little girl, cute little girl, blonde hair, blue eyes, and you know what she's got? In one hand, a piece of paper, and in the other hand, a, pe a pen. And what what she want? Um, it's overpriced wrapping paper, gummy bears, or pizza kits. I mean, I don't know what it is, it's the stuff. and. It's the most pleasant confrontation, but it's a confrontation. And so, Mr. Stroman, will you buy my stuff? And so, I mean, I just ask, uh, so what, what, what for? Um, what's it for, Mommy? Um, <laughs> playground equipment. Oh, it's for playground equipment. So I, I ask a few more questions, and here's what I find out. They have old playground equipment at the school. And if I don't buy some new one, it's gonna gobble the kid up and it's gonna be my fault, okay? <laughs> it's a confrontation. And I don't know if I'd recommend this to you, y'all are way too professional, but I mean, I already have all the overpriced wrapping paper, gummy bears, and pizza kits that I need. But I wanna help the thing, because otherwise I know the thing's gonna gobble her up, it's gonna be my fault. And so I'll just say, you know, can I just give you some money? Mommy? Can I have some money? And they don't know what to do with it. And you know what's the worst thing about it? They get a toy if they, if they sell enough kits. And I'm not buying a kit. So it's a confrontation. I want you to get out of the confrontation business if you're ever tempted to get into it. And so uh, let me just share a little bit of Oklahoma history. I'm just curious who recognizes this picture? Um, why Oklahoma? That's just. It's where I live, okay? So um, this is, is a, um, a very famous and very successful Oklahoma fundraiser. Um, his career was in the early part of the last century. So in the early 1900s, very, very successful. In fact, he was successful to the extent that others, other aspiring fundraisers, would come to him and they wanted to, to study, they would like for him to mentor them. Um, nobody recognize him? Let me give you his name. Um, he, um, Chuck, so what would his formal name be? Okay, so this is Charles. Uh, Charles Arthur, and um, Charles Arthur, he is quoted as saying, he would, he would make this comment to those that he was mentoring. Here's what he said. You can raise more money, he said, with a smile and a gun than you can with a smile alone. Now, his last name was Floyd. He went by a nickname, um, pretty boy, Floyd, okay? You, you, you recognize the guy? Now, I'm not recommending his approach, okay? But he said, you can raise more money with a smile and a gun than you can with a smile alone. He had one problem with his fundraising approach, and that was repeat donors. Very hard to get people to, to agree to the second gift. And so, but that's confrontational fundraising. We don't recommend it. Um, instead, we want to uh, give you an, an idea how, about an alternative. Now, we said tip number two is to make advice visits. And we already um, shared that, that idea that if you want advice, ask for money. By the way, have any of you had that experience? I mean, you go out there and ask for money and you come, come home with a truckload of advice, most of which you really can't do anything with. <coughs> So I see a few of us, yeah. But if you want money, ask for advice. Now again, I'm not suggesting for you to be manipulative about this, but one of the things that I love to do is to come up with a, a very genuine, sincere advice question that I can ask that will help me know whether I should at some point be asking about money, okay? And so, um, with, in, in Kelly's case, um, we're not that well acquainted, 
yet. We're working on it, right? Okay, so one of the early questions that I want to ask her as it relates to, um, to advice is her opinion, her thoughts. So let's say that we've met, I'm representing the, um, uh, the university. Uh, we've got a number of key uh, priorities that are in part of our strategic plan. And so one of the things I want to just ask is, as you, as you look at our plans for the future, I'm curious, which of those would you say is of most interest to you? Okay, now, we know what we want and what we, we said we have needs, but we don't have needs. And I, our needs aren't that important. Um, Kelly didn't become a triple billionaire by other people making all of her decisions for her, okay? Um, do we believe that our donors have enough brain cells to make wise decisions giving money away? That the same brain that gave them the ability to, to earn or to acquire the resources that we're asking for? Absolutely. So I want to engage both the head and the heart in the process to find out what I should be asking about. Asking for advice, in my experience, has probably been the most powerful uh, lever in the success that I've experienced, not just in fundraising, but in, in life. Um, may I have your advice about X? So master that thing of advice visit. Ask for advice. Engage the prospective donor in solving the problem if it's a problem they care about. And if they don't care about your problem, it's not your job to change their priorities. It's our, our job to recognize it, and if, so let, let, let's say with, with Kelly that um, you know, I'm, I'm raising money for a children's sports program. And let's just say Kelly doesn't like children, <laughs> she doesn't like sports, <coughs> and she doesn't like people who like children and sports. <laughs> you see where this is going? Um, then. Even though I have a confirmed case of dumb guy syndrome, I'm going to promptly figure out that she is not my best prospect, okay? So if she don't care about what we care about, what probably the best thing I can do to redeem the conversation is, who should I be talking to? Do you know anybody who does like people? <laughs> or who likes people who like people? <laughs> nope, don't know, not around here. Okay, so we're gonna make advice visits. Um, <clears throat> And so, again, that's about learning how to not ask for money. Um, I mean, again, so many times, we're much more polite than this, but so many times our fundraising approach is something like this. It goes like this. Hi, Kelly, I'm Kent. Um, I don't have any money. You do. Can I have it? <laughs> yeah, not very effective. And oftentimes, I mean, we see this all the time, that approach. Right, Eden? We see that approach oftentimes, why is it always a guy? It's a guy in the bank with a, with a mask and a gun, okay? Or it's a guy under the bridge with cardboard and a hand, okay? But that, that's not our approach. So um, let's learn how to not ask for money, ask for advice. Um, so with that, one of the things that, um, that we've really built a lot around, um, and I think this is in your handout also, okay, it's, it's a 10 step staircase. And um, the print's really small, so what I want to do quickly is just read, the, read our way up the staircase. You'll notice at the top of the staircase is a door marked yes. I mean, we, when we make a, a request for a gift, we want to hear yes, right? But as you noticed, if we start with the wrong question, <laughs> and Kelly was so polite, she said no. She didn't vocalize the words that came in front of the no, what was going on in her mind, okay? <laughs> So, or after, yeah. So um, um, you'll notice that there are, on step number 10, we're asking for a gift. But on steps one through nine, we're not asking for a gift, but we're asking about asking for a gift. So again, if we're gonna be our most successful in fundraising, we have to learn how to not ask for gifts. We're asking about asking. So real quickly, step number one is getting acquainted. Getting acquainted. And um, we just met, I mean, one of the questions that I might ask Kelly after that introduction is, so um, have you, are you at all familiar with University of Iowa? Okay, that's a get acquainted question. 
Um, one of the things that we might ask after we've introduced her to her, so what do you think? That is a really small, non-directive, but powerful question. What do you think? And um, I wish we had time to jump into the whole thing about um, event-based fundraising. Um, actually, about four or five weeks from now, um, I'll be speaking at the International Conference on Fundraising. My topic is special events and major gifts, how to get from one to the other. But um, um, oftentimes we, we get acquainted and we want to ask that question after we've given a little bit of a, a description. So what do you think? Many times people come to our events, they get acquainted with us, we never ask them what do you think. We start assuming things about what they think and what they'll do. And I don't want to guess, I don't want to assume, I would much rather ask so that the person who has the answers can share the answers and then we can both be on the same proverbial page. Step number two is introducing the project. And uh, as, as we're playing this out here, we're going to introduce the project. Um, there's a great need in this part of the country for a children's hospital, a facility that will allow doctors and patients to come together in the most effective way. So we're going to introduce that project. And then you heard my question on that one. So as you think about this project, uh, which aspect of it is of most interest to you? Now, if she says, mm, none of it, again, that's a subtle clue. And um, <laughs> no more, OK, subtle clue. And I'm going to use that. Every question that I ask is intended to be strategic to tell me something about what, is, what lies on the path ahead. The other thing that I hope that you'll notice is that most of the questions that we're asking are not head questions, but they're heart questions. So if you want to know about facts or data, ask head questions. Um, I, was at a, um, I was at an entertainment venue. This was on a cruise, and, and there was a show. And this, um, this guy had, um, the, the entertainer, had some kind of a prize for the couple who had been married the longest, you know, they're celebrating the anniversary. And so 82 years married or something like that. And this lady kind of hobbled down to the, to the platform and got the prize. And here's what the guy said, you know, congratulations on your, on your anniversary. He said, um, I was told that it's not polite to ask a woman her age. How much do you weigh? <laughs> um, that would be a fact question. That's a head question. Um, that's a whole different thing than a heart question. So um, introducing the project, um, I want to know what do you care about? Step number three is asking about giving. And I'll tell you, um, boy, if you want to come to understand somebody's soul, ask them um, how, did they come, uh, how, how did they learn to give or how did they become so generous? And I'll tell you, the, the, um, the, the most powerful, most memorable response that I've gotten to that question, I was interviewing uh, board members of a foundation doing a project and yeah, one of the questions I was asking is so uh, tell me how did you uh, come to be so generous and I'm just, that's the question I'll ask if I know they're generous if I don't know they're generous I'm not going to ask them about being generous because I don't want to make the false assumption I'll ask where did you learn to give uh, but this guy he was very very generous I knew that and I asked him I said Jim how did you uh, learn to be so generous and here's what he told me I'll never <coughs> forget this he said uh, by watching people die rich no, in fact, he said, he said, from the tragedy of watching people die rich. And I mean, I had to ask a follow-up question on that. And I could never have learned that by doing any online research, by going to the foundation website, uh, by Googling this man's name. But he told me so much about himself and gave, gave me, uh, whether intended to or not, he gave me an invitation to follow up on that conversation by saying, well, tell me more about that. So asking about giving, I'm going to go in parentheses here. How much time do we have? OK, don't let me get lost. So, um, so step number four is asking about purpose, asking about purpose. Um, here's the, the question that we often ask that I believe is the wrong question. And so we're engaged in the donor, and so we'll say, uh, you know, what, what would you like to give to? What would you like your gift to be used for? And, of course, we never ask 
without first giving a context. And so usually the context that we give before asking that is we're going to build a building. So you know, what do we need? We need bricks and shingles and glass for the windows or it's salaries, um, it's utility bill. So what would you like your gift to be used for? And poor Kelly's sitting there, she's thinking, okay, not bricks, not windows, not shingles, not salaries, not utilities. I don't think any of that stuff. So I believe that's the wrong question. It's a common question. I want to give you a substitute. What would you like your gift to accomplish? What would you like your gift to accomplish? And when I've asked people of varying means, whether it's of limited means or like Kelly, inexhaustible means, what would you like your gift to accomplish? I've never had somebody say, you know, I'm just hoping we could pay one more month's utility bill. Um, man, I'd like to pay your salary. Um, how about some new shingles on that roof? No, no, but I mean, that is a heart question. And if you want to hear somebody's heart, what would you like your gift to accomplish? I mean, I had somebody say, I would love that in our neighborhood, in our part of the city, that there would be no child ever go to bed hungry at night. So what will that gift be used for? Can that pay salaries? Buy shingles? Cover the utility bill? You bet. That's what it takes, but that's not what it accomplishes. Ask that heart question. What would you like your gift to accomplish? But then be sure and listen. Have you ever been in that city, setting where we ask the question and we tell them what their answer is? <laughs> Bad idea. Okay, whoops. Um, step number five, asking about form and, and the context for that. I like to, to uh, put in front of a prospect just a list of some of the different ways that people give. Um, we oftentimes give by cash. Do you know what form of wealth represents the most wealth in our country? Yeah, so it's, it's whatever it is, stocks, bonds, um, intellectual property, it's not cash. Um, somebody who was supposed to know this told me that 9%, 9% of America's wealth is held in cash or cash equivalent. That means, now I'm a recovering accountant, but I think I've got this right, that means that 91%, more than 10 times, is held in some non-cash form. And so if the only thing we know how to do is to ask for cash, 39 cents, and it has to be a check, look at what we're missing. And so I love to put, again, a, just a list of some of the different ways that people make gifts in front of somebody and ask them, um, in your experience of giving, I'm just curious, which of these different types of giving have you used yourself? And Here's one of the interesting things. You know what's the most common response I get? You mean me personally? <laughs> yeah. So we're talking personal. Well, you know, I give by, here's, here's what I often hear. You know, I give by ca cash and I look at, oh, gifts in kind. Yeah, I guess I took some stuff to the Goodwill. Um, so I'll ask about some of the more common or obvious. What about uh, stocks, bonds, securities? Um, yeah, I've got a lot of those, but I, I, I haven't given them away. Um, anyhow, it's, it's just interesting to listen to people's response. This is a part of that education process. And oftentimes people haven't thought about the benefits of giving, not cash. We have an opportunity to be a part of that process. On step number six, <coughs> wow, this is a big one, asking about amount. Now you noticed earlier I made that big mistake with Kelly of making up the, the amount. I didn't ask her about 39 cents. That's a mistake. But I ask her about 350 million, and that's a mistake. And the reason those are both mistakes is why? Why are those reasons? I mean, why, why are those mistakes? <coughs> Who was it? Yeah, it's because those numbers belong to me. Who of us thinks that the right person to answer the question about gift amount is the one who's asking for it rather than the one who's making the gift. Now, it sounds ridiculous as we sit here today, right? But I mean, I can't tell you how many prominent consulting firms in our country will de deliberately, diligently, unfailingly work with clients 
that we have to come up with the right answer and then, then tell them. So here's how that conversation goes. So Kelly, you know we're in this big, uh, this big campaign, we've got to raise $350 million for the new children's hospital. And um, with your, uh, your past generosity and, and with your means, um, we, we think you should be one of the top donors, someplace in the 50 to $100 million range. We think you should. If you have any sentences or thoughts that revolve around that combination, we think you should, I think you should, I think you will, why don't you, okay? Um, what are my odds on that one? <laughs> Slim, well, you're generous, okay? I was thinking none, okay? So, but, but again, the question of amount. So do not answer that question for your donor. I think we want to prompt and inspire. Our job is inspiration, it's not expectation. Okay, and so the most powerful tool to use for this part of the conversation, I think, is the, the gift chart. And um, I, what page? We've got a gift chart. We're going to go there here in a little bit. Um, that's just a $10 million um, chart. But the thing, it's, it's on page five. With a gift chart in hand, appropriate to the project, I can ask Kelly. Here's what I'm going to not ask her. So how much money can I get from you? Okay, or what amount are you ready to, to write on the check? No, what I wanna ask is, so I'm, I'm curious, I know now's not the appropriate time. In fact, um, one of the things, I'll, I'll comment more on this later, one of the things early on on the staircase, I'm gonna ask, could I have your uh, permission at the appropriate time to just prepare a personalized gift proposal for you? Okay, that's a permission question. And uh, with her permission, I'm gonna ask about the stuff that's gonna go on the proposal. Why? Because I wanna ask her to say something that she wants to say yes to. So we've already established that now is not the time. I'm not here to ask for a gift today, but I'm gonna ask at the appropriate time, if you had all the information that you needed, and if you were adequately motivated, in other words, it really was in, in line with, uh, with your priorities, what range of gifts should we be talking about? Okay, so what range of gift should we be talking about? There is some intentional ambiguity there. It's different from how much money can I have. It's different from how much money do you have? Okay, what range? And the reason that I ask for a range is because if she will answer on that basis, it's gonna open the door for me to ask one of the most powerful questions. And um, so let's just, can, can we just adapt? Forget about 350 million, but since we got a $10 million gift chart, can we go to that? So um, what page? Five, page five. So um, just work with me a minute. I'm, um, man, it's just only $10 million now for the whole campaign. So I'm just curious, Kelly, at the appropriate time, if you were fully informed and adequately motivated, um, what, what range of gift would you say might f fit with your charitable priorities for, for us for now for this project? So a range of, what was that? Around a million. Okay, so I'm curious. You notice she's being just a little bit uh, uh, obscure on this. When you say around a million, how far around a million are you talking? <laughs> Okay, so someplace between 900,000, 1.1, okay. Now, the, the thing I love about a range is it's not a number. And um, the first time I really discovered the power of this, I was doing a feasibility study. I wasn't asking for a gift, but I was asking about gift expectations. And um, on this particular project, um, the bottom end of the gift chart, actually it's pretty close uh, to this, the bottom end of the leadership gifts, the smallest leadership gift was $300,000. And the next step up from that was $500,000. And so this, this lady responded, she said, you know, we'd probably be at the bottom end of that leadership range. And so I didn't have it memorized, she had this, 
she had the gift chart. So I, I just looked at that and said, wow. So am I hearing you right? You're talking about someplace between half a million dollars and $300,000? And she said, yes. And I'm just a lost Okie. I mean, that's a lot of money where I come from. And so that's why I said, wow, that just seems so generous. Thank you for, I, I know you haven't made the gift, but I mean, thank you for thinking of us so generously. But I have a question. When it comes time, 300,000, 500,000, how will you decide? Now, how will you decide is again an invitation to open a window to look inside the soul. And here's what she told me. This was an arts project. She said, you know, we love the arts. It's so important to us. And um, she said, we love this project and we're gonna contribute to it. But we're also very involved in our church. Um, we're preparing for a campaign which is going to relocate the church. And so it'll probably just, I mean, we're gonna support both of them. But it'll probably just depend who talks to us first. Now, Eden, what do you do when somebody tells you that? Is that an invitation? You bet it is. And so um, I, I got to kind of finish the story, fast forward here. Um, by the way, I reported to the, uh, the client that there was somebody that they needed to talk to right away. <laughs> and they didn't rush it, but they were deliberate, they were appropriate. And um, uh, when it came time, they asked for a gift. The gift wasn't $300,000, and it wasn't $500,000. It's not that she was lying, um, but she didn't know what her gift was going to be, but they gave a million dollars. A million dollars. Whose answer counts? Absolutely. So again, when you ask the questions, be sure you don't answer them. We can answer it too high, we can answer it too low. In any case, our answer is the wrong answer unless it's the identical answer of the donor. And um, Jennifer, yesterday in class, I don't know if you remember, I asked this question, who's a good guesser? You know, we have a tendency to guess for other people. So I'm just curious today, who would say, I'm a, I'm a pretty good guesser? I mean, anybody pretty good at guessing? What was that? I haven't won the lottery yet. You haven't? <laughs> Okay, the, she said yes, so I guess she's still playing, okay? So I had a guy yesterday, he said he was pretty good. He said he gets it right more than half of the time. So I was benevolent, said 51%, 51%. Now, um, I have to disclose, um, I am not a good guesser. And this is not hypothetical, this is the real deal. So my first two grandchildren were twin, uh, twin girls, okay? They are not identical twins, but to me, they look a lot alike. <laughs> Juliana and Michaela. Now, statistically, somebody help me here, statistically, what would you say are the odds of my getting the right name with the right girl? <laughs> Joshua, help me here. Statistically. 50-50. Yeah, I have 50-50 odds. I am not that good. <laughs> I'm sad to report that. But, um, and, and by the way, uh, what was that, uh, jo Joe. Joe was the student, he said he was 51%. And I said, my recommendation to you would be to drop out of college. And if you have a job, quit the job, go to the casino. <laughs> if you're that good, they will eventually pay you to stop coming around, <laughs> okay? And here's the thing, we're not that good. And I mean, if you get it right one time out of 100, you're better than most. I'd say let's get out of the guessing business and get into the asking business so that we don't have to assume and we can actually work on real life stuff. Um, step number seven is asking about timing. Asking about timing. And there are two timing questions that are important. This isn't the second one, this is the first one. Okay, the second one that this isn't is when are you gonna make your gift? You know, when, when do we get the check? When can I cash the check? We want to know that, but it's not relevant. At this point, it's not relevant. So this question about timing is, when would be the appropriate time for you to make a decision of this magnitude? I mean, maybe for you that million dollars isn't that big a deal, but for us it's kind of big. Um, when would be the right time for you to make your decision? We have a tendency to impose our timeline on the donor 
And here's what I found. When people are pressured into doing something, they become resistant. Think about the last time somebody tried to get you to do something, whether you wanted to or not. You know, you wanted to and now you decide you didn't want to because you're getting so much pressure. Okay, uh, actually write this down, donors are people. And so a lot of times they have human behavior, okay? So um, people when they're pressured tend to be actually less generous than when they're invited or when they're inquired, when they're explored. When's the right time for you to make a decision like this? Now, when do I want a decision? Realistically, yesterday, before we were talking, and I wanted to make it for you. It's not gonna happen, okay? <laughs> but um, had a donor one time and uh, asked the question, when would be the right time for you to make a decision? And here's what he said, and kind of unpacked this statement. He said, at our age, he was referring to himself and his wife, at our age, what does that tell you? Older, thank you. Um, thank you for not saying elderly, because I'm his age. Um, I wasn't then. I haven't always been this old. Uh, most people didn't think I'd get this old. Okay, but he said, at our age, my wife and I don't make big gift decisions alone, because we view that kind of like giving away our kids' inheritance. So he said, we make those decisions as a family when we're together at Thanksgiving time each year. Okay, now help me for a moment here. When do I need a decision from this particular donor? Before Thanksgiving. When do I need a decision from the donor? Day after Thanksgiving. Day after Thanksgiving at the earliest, okay? Because it's their timeline. And I could impose mine, you know I have to know today. I can give you an answer today. <laughs> I can give you a digit and I can give you a zero. You can put those in any order that you want. <laughs> Some place between 01 and 90. Um, that's about the best you're going to get. So again, I want to know timing-wise, when's the best time for you to make a decision? I asked this at a foundation one time. I said, what gift cycle should we apply in? And this was in, like, I don't know, September, October. She said, you know, if you wanted to, you could apply in the last quarter of this year. I would suggest, however, she said, I would suggest, however, you should wait until the first quarter of next year. I already know our docket, that was the term she used, our docket's going to be really full last quarter this year. I think you'll get better consideration early next year. What do you think? How soon do we need the money? Okay. Our timeline doesn't matter. And if we're in a panic, we can transfer that panic to the donor and they will make a gift. It will be less dollars, less enthusiastic, less appreciated on both sides, and less likely to be repeated. Um, next step, step number eight, naming, asking about naming. Now, if you're not open to name gifts, don't ask this question. But uh, we have the presumption that other people want to put their name on a building, right? <clears throat> I had a guy one time um, I said, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what do you think about naming opportunities? He said, this was kind of a grouchy guy. He said, well, I'll tell you what, I'd give you more money to keep my name off a building than to put it on. Yeah. Well, so I had to ask, you know, we got several buildings, how many you want to keep it off of? <laughs> <laughs> um, another guy, I was, uh, I was asking, this was in an attorney's office, very prestigious law firm asking that question, you know, what are your feelings about name <laughs> gifts? He said, he said, I think it's a despicable practice and it raises lots of money. <laughs> so in one sentence, he told me that he was not a good candidate for a name gift, but he knew somebody who was, right? So asking about naming. And then uh, step number nine, asking about deciding. This isn't the same as asking about timing, but um, so, I'm noticing your left hand. Are you married? Yeah. Okay, and that helps with that earlier conversation <laughs> we had. Me too, by the way. Um, so um, I'm curious, Kelly, when, when you make big gift decisions like this, someplace in the one to $10 million range, um, who's involved in that process? I mean, you yourself, does your husband have a vote, kids, parents, I mean, how, how does that work? Uh, mostly me. Okay, she said, mostly me and my husband. I and mean, those are the words, that wasn't really the inflection. <laughs> okay. 
But here's the thing, and I was sharing with, um, at, at lunch time, yeah, did we talk about this, Eden? So anyhow, I, um, I was talking, uh, asking this question to a foundation trustee one time. This was a family foundation. And um, the, the, the one who established the foundation had five sons. And I was talking to one of the sons. I said, so, I mean, I'm just curious, how do the decisions get made at the foundation? Here's what he told me. He said, um, the trustees are my dad and my brothers and myself. So there's six of us, five boys, dad. He said, we all have a vote. Dad decides. <laughs> okay? Now, the, uh, the website would tell me there are five trustees. I would assume that they all have a vote, but I didn't know that dad decides until I asked the question. So again, how are decisions made? If I were doing it all over again today, and I'm not, by the way, there's not gonna be a third edition of asking about asking, but if I was doing it all over, I think I'd move that question lower on the staircase. But as it relates to that or any of the other questions, it really doesn't matter so much where they are. I mean, I would keep step number 10 at, at step number 10. Um, but the, the point is you wanna ask the question before you ask the big question, the ask. And that's on step number 10. So actually, um, I'm gonna share with you my favorite um, question for step number 10, and it's kind of contrary to the illustration here because that's got a yes. I'm gonna ask the question in such a way that there's a no, all right? So here's the question I like to ask. Remember earlier we asked about a gift proposal and I want you to know I've been listening very keenly to everything that you've said as we visited over the months. And I've put together a proposal that I would love for you to get a, get a look at. We're gonna look at it here in just a moment. It's a draft proposal. And so, um, actually, you happen to have that. The, um, yes, so this proposal that I put together, I've listened care carefully, Katie, Kelly, I get confused. Um, and, and by the way, the reason we have a draft proposal is that gives everybody permission to change it until it's right, okay? And so um, I've listened as carefully as I could. And what I'd like to ask you to do is to review that. Take your time, thank you. Um, now that you've done that, here's my question. So Kelly. Is there anything about the proposal that would have to change to get your enthusiastic approval? Okay, now what answer do I really want to hear? No. We used to be afraid of no. Don't you love no? I mean, I love no if it's the right question. But here's the thing, whose answer is it to give? It's Kelly's. And um, if she says, I mean, anybody want to speculate what's the most common response that I get to that question? What was it? I said you spelled my name wrong. Okay, spelled your name wrong. Have you ever done that? You know what? It's a terrible thing. It's not so bad if you marked it draft. I wondered if you'd catch that. <laughs> no, but here's the thing. Here's the most common response when I ask that question. Is there anything about this gift proposal that would have to change in order for you to enthusiastically approve it? And she says just one thing, draft. All the rest of it's exactly in line. And if we're listening carefully, that's what we're gonna hear. And I anticipated that, so I do have one without the word draft. <laughs> I'm prepared, okay? I wanna be prepared. But again, here's the point, it's about a conversation. And I want to hear her response. And, and she says, one million dollars over three years. What I meant was a million a year over three years. Okay, is there anything else that needs to change? <laughs> okay, but whatever it is, I wanna say, um, you know what, we will gladly make those changes. When would you like to see it again? So who's in charge of this whole thing? I mean, we're, we're leading it. it. I mean, if we wait for her to lead with those kind of resources, she can't afford, she's not gonna live long enough to make this many million dollar decisions, too many. So 
um, we want to follow her lead. Sometimes she says, you know what, we can meet one time. I'm going to have to hustle up those stairs. Okay. So real quickly, um, we're down to uh, less than an hour remaining and uh, on page number three. Here's the thing I want to say. As you think about your, uh, your, your uh, donor calls, the most important part of a donor call is not what you say. Don't stress over that. Prepare, yes, but do not stress about what you're going to say because that's not the most important part. It's what you hear. And, and so um, I want to ask, we're going to skip the parentheses part, but I want to ask if you would just join me and say this together because it's so f powerful. Okay, here we go. The most important part of a donor call is not what you say. Instead, it's what you hear. Let's do that one more time. Everybody gets to join in this time. The most important part of a donor call is not what you say. Instead, it's what you hear. And I hope if you take nothing else away with you from this session, that that will be emblazoned on your mind. Don't stress over what you're going to say. Prepare, but listen carefully so that you can hear what the donor wants to do, and that's going to allow you to help him or her make a well-informed decision. So, today's big idea. Listen to your donors. I mean, how non-traditional is that? Listen to your donors. And if, in order for us to listen strategically, we have to ask strategic questions. I'm hopeful that some of these questions that we've shared today can be a part of a solution. Don't, um, and don't ask my questions. I mean, those are Kent questions. Make them yours. Kelly, I can't wait to hear what the Kelly questions sound like, but you're gonna own them. You're gonna take them with you. That's why we ask about asking. So real quickly, tip number three, engage call teams. A call team consists of a peer and a pro. The pro, by definition, is that person who gets paid for asking for money. The person who is paid on, on the staff of the organization that you represent. The peer, again, by definition, is somebody who's working for free. And by the way, do you know this? People will work harder for free than they will for pay. Don't you love volunteers? And today, we had an opportunity to hear from the person who actually wrote the book on volunteering. Thank you, Helen. Um, but, but engage those volunteers, and it's just amazing. I wish we had time to, to really unpack that in a session of its own. It's amazing how the dynamic changes when there's more than one person in the room as part of the call team. Um, the qualifications. Do not compromise on the qualifications of the peer or the pro must be passionate about the mission. Okay, have to have passion for the mission. If they don't care about the, the mission or if they just care a little bit about it, don't, don't bring them in the room. Uh, they will derail the ask. Um, and then also have to be generous. Now, don't have to be on generous as defined by generosity of the prospect. But I have to be generous in my own terms, okay? And so um, one of the things to be prepared for, prepare everybody who's going to be in the room with the, the donor to pre be prepared to ask, answer this question. If the donor says, so tell me about your gift, how are you going to respond? Now here's what I uh, coach my clients with. It's your decision whether your response has a number in it or not, because that's not really the question. But talk about your gift. Describe your gift. If you want to share the number, that's your deal. But here's what's really powerful. I could say, you know what? This project is so important to me and to my family that for us, over these next three years, it's going to be our number three charitable priority. Now, Kelly, as we visit, here's what I'm going to say is, um, at this point, we know each other so well. I'm going to share with you um, I mean, I wish that I had more resources. My giving would be much more. But what this means for our family, over the next three years, our contribution is going to be in the $10,000 range. Now, I would never insult you by asking you to match my gift. Okay? But would you consider matching my commitment and just add three, four, five zeros? 
Okay? So again, take what's yours, own it, be, be personal. Like I said, there I shared my number, but what's more important, where does this fit in my charitable priorities? I mean, I had a guy one time I was asking, this was uh, a corporate ask. Well, it wasn't an ask, it was an inquiry on a, on a feasibility. And I, I asked this question, I said, uh, where, where would this project fall on your charitable priorities? On a scale of one to 10, so um, 10 is high, right? So a, a 10, nine, or eight, that's a high priority. Um, seven, six, five, four, mid, three, two, one, low. He said, well, for us, he said, this would be a one, and out of 100, at the one level, this would be at the bottom. And I took that to mean that this was not gonna be a, a real big gift, okay? So, but it was his answer to the question, where does it fit? And you cannot afford to have somebody in the room asking for a gift who has not already been generous with this project for this purpose. So I wanna ask Kelly to follow my example. Don't give my number, that's my number. Um, but um, sometimes, even with uh, a board, we're gonna say, you know what, collectively, our board has given all this money, we're so proud of them because they've given more than our board's ever given. But that's generous on their scale. Would you take that and leverage it for a number that would be appropriate, generous on, on your scale? Call teams. Number four, uh, prepare a written gift proposal. And um, you've got that on, I believe it's on page four. Um, that's so important, that gift proposal is so important. And what it does, and again, you can see the sample that's there, it's very simple and straightforward. But what it does is it reduces our understanding down to writing. I need to be clear what I'm asking Kelly for. I need to know unmistakably when she says yes, what she's saying yes to. And will that be clear to the person who follows me after I get hit by a train? And by the same token, I want Kelly to be clear what I'm asking of her and what she's saying yes to. And again, we're not hopeful of this, but if it has to be the estate that settles the gift, what was agreed to? It's not just something that was made up and you know a note to file. Written gift proposal. Um, and you've got the proposal, I'm gonna skim past this. Um, a a three-year solution, um, many times in a major fundraising campaign, we're asking for a three-year pledge. Why don't we do that when we're not in a major fundraising campaign? It's because we didn't think of it. And uh, because somebody who's an, who's an accountant that's not recovering read this 11th commandment in the Bible and says, thou shalt think only in 12-month periods or less, <laughs> okay? It's not there. I've read the whole book. It's not there. And so the three-year solution, here's the principle that's behind that. Most important principle is that people can be more generous when they have more time. People can be more generous when they have more time. And I'll tell you, if pretty boy Floyd were to walk through that door right now with a mask and a gun, with or without a smile, and he came up to me and said, Kent, give me all you got. I would give him one gold coin and, hmm, and this little folder. There's some cash in here. There are also some credit cards in there. And he would end up the net loser on the deal, I'm telling you. <laughs> but on the other hand, if he would uh, practice bank robbery the way it's done today and just take a small percentage of everything that goes through my account, over three years time, he will fare very well. The same thing is true with you. Now don't do the mask and the gun thing, but give your donors time. Give them time to be as generous as they want to be. They will be more generous if they have more time. Um, tip number, oh, a lot of times we say, you know, what, what stuff do we need? You know, I don't, don't have all the stuff together. So if I'm gonna ask a donor, what stuff do I need? And we want the big brochure, right? And brochures are good, I love brochures, especially those that are well done. But if you don't have anything else, have a case statement. What's that one page that talks about the problem, the solution, the price tag? Um, and, and so that's our campaign goals. And then a gift chart. Somebody said, Kent, you would actually use a gift chart with a donor? Why not? And um, in my experience, that's the most often neglected and readily available tool. Tell yourself 
what size of gifts and what number of gifts uh, are necessary to reach the goal. But then tell the audience. No reason to keep it a secret. When we talk about the top gift, what range top gift? Now here's what we're afraid of. What if they want to give more? I mean really, how many times is that the problem? Okay, but if they want to give more, Kelly, I mean the, the top gift, if it's a million dollars, she says, you know what, my greatest desire, I was thinking three times that. We can fix a new gift chart, that's not a problem. But in most cases, what the gift chart does is lift the sights because we have a tendency to think in terms of average. And average is a midpoint between two points of significance. It's a midpoint of insignificance. It means absolutely nothing. The average gift size for the campaign is an interesting statistic, but that doesn't tell you what the biggest number is, doesn't tell you what the smallest number is. The gift chart does. It's a very powerful tool. You use that in your kit. So, um, what do we have, about 10, more, 10 minutes? Five minutes? Okay, time's over, is that what it is? Okay. <laughs> Did everybody get their, uh, who wanted to put their card in the bag? Oh, come on now, you guys get after. Real quick, um, as it relates to big, big gifts, I'm just gonna touch on this real quickly, and that is, um, what is a big gift? It's important for you to have an idea, you know, when we talk about larger gifts, um, somebody else's answer isn't the right answer for your organization. So one way you can figure that out is, is um, what is the gift that, that size that when you get it, you do the happy dance? You know what I'm talking about, happy dance? Yes. Who knows what I'm talking about? Happy dance. Who will stand up and demonstrate that? <laughs> I mean, right now, on film, right here? No? Okay, well, so much for that. Or it's the gift that when it arrives or when you hear of it, it redirects your attention. I had a meeting this afternoon, but I don't anymore, okay? That's a big gift. Um, another way to look at it, maybe, uh, you know, what's the largest gift ever in your organization? When you get a gift around that number, big gift, okay? Uh, maybe what's the biggest gift that we got last year? The point is, get an idea, and um, um, I don't even know if I have this slide in here. Um, the reason that we encourage creating a gift chart and then working from the top of the chart down is this. If the big gift in order to, to meet our campaign, if it's a million dollars, don't go looking for $100,000 gifts. There are no millions in 100,000. How profound is that, okay? <laughs> but on the other hand, look for a million. There will be some hundred thousands in that because we always find what we're looking for or less, okay? So look for what you need. Accept what you're not looking for, it's welcome, okay? But we always find what we're looking for or less. Uh, I'm gonna skim past the gift chart, we've already looked at that. Um, oh, beautiful quote, don't you think? Thank you. So real quickly, two, two risks to avoid as we're climbing the staircase, as we're involved in conversational fundraising. Risk number one is the risk of early rejection. You saw that so vividly demonstrated earlier today when I asked Kelly, I don't have any money, you do, can I have it? And she said, no. no. And on the outside, she was smiling, okay? The answer is no. That's the risk of early rejection. We ask too soon and we get a no too soon. The other risk that we also want to avoid is the, the risk of early acceptance. And that's where Kelly says, I say, can I have a gift? She says, yes, here's a dollar, here's a thousand. Here's 100,000, I mean, I don't know what her, her go away gift is, but after she says yes too soon, I get back, I'm doing the happy dance and my boss is not. And says, um, Tom says, you know, Kent, I think you left a couple of zeros behind. I go back to Kelly. I think I left a couple of zeros behind. She said, not today you didn't, okay? So she said yes too soon. So we want to guard against both of those risks, early acceptance, early rejection. Um, real quick, discipline the process, it works. I'm not making this stuff up. If it didn't work, I wouldn't be sharing it with you. But I will tell you, these seven tips, if applied, will be very powerful. And so tip number seven, manage your meetings. And uh, when you have a meeting, I'm gonna illustrate this real quickly. If you've got a 60 minute meeting, the first third of that meeting, you've got 20 minutes, to say hello, 
to confirm here's why we're meeting and to confirm our time frame. I understand what, when uh, our meeting was set up, we've got about an hour, is that right? So, um, well, we did then, we've got 50 minutes now. I mean, I don't know what it is, but I wanna know. And, uh, but first, I wanna tell you uh, what, what we're involved with over at the university. And you know, we said we were, going, we were here today to ask for your, uh, your, your financial support. Spend a third of the time of your meeting on that stuff. It's all important stuff. When we get to that one third point, ask your biggest question that you came to ask. And if, if today is to ask for the gift, I'm gonna have that conversation about the, the uh, proposal, the draft proposal. I'm gonna put it in front of what would have to change in order for you to say an enthusiastic yes. Now, I've asked that. We're 20 minutes into a 60 minute meeting. The rich stuff is what comes after. You know what we usually do? 59 and a half minutes. And then we ask the question. And it doesn't matter whether they want to respond or not. They can't. They got something else lined up and we gotta go, okay? Well, we do that, we fill it up because we're nervous and we're not prepared. I want her to have adequate time and I wanna be able to listen if it's objections, I wanna hear those objections, I wanna to respond to them. If it's acceptance, I wanna know um, what this means to her. Why is this so important uh, to, to hear that reinforcement? And so the, the, uh, the listen and the reply time, that's two thirds of the, minute, of the time. Here's the other thing I would say, is plan to finish before you're out of time. If I've got 60 minutes, I wanna have a 50 to 55 minute plan. So that if something goes different than planned, as if that's ever happened. If something goes different to plan, we have time to adjust, okay? Now, real quick, the listening test. Um, I'm just gonna give this to you real quick in the room. We've got a prospect, we've got a pro, we've got a peer. And the question that we've gotta ask is whose voice did we hear the most? So when the meeting's over, we're back in the car, headed back to campus, I wanna ask the peer or the pro, whichever I'm with. So give me your candid assessment. In the meeting we just finished, whose voice did we hear the most? The right answer is the prospect. That's a hard standard to achieve. But when you've achieved that, you've mastered conversational fundraising. So today's big idea, you've heard it before, it's listen to your donors. I wish we had more time, but I see the hook coming my direction. Um, is there a volunteer um, Jennifer, would you mind um, pulling a couple cards out? Uh, real quickly, um, if she, she does that, I'm gonna read the name, and then um, who's ever name I read, if you'll just see me during the break between, uh, I've got a couple of things that you can choose from. So I've got card number one and card number, what comes after? Oh yeah, two. Okay, so um, where is Mary Taylor? Okay, Mary, I want to see you after class. Come to the principal's office. And Patty McCarthy. Great. We'll see you guys after class. I'm going to turn it back to Jennifer. Thank you very much. <laughs>